Welcome everyone to the special meeting for the 21st of July 2021. Um, this meeting is open to the public and will be live streamed. I'd like to thank those of you in the room with us today and acknowledge everyone watching council via council's social media channels. I acknowledge the mayor who's not here, the deputy mayor, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor MacDonald, portfolio leader, Councillor Carl, Councillors, CEO, general manager of planning and development group. I acknowledge the Aboriginal parties whose song lines traverse these lands we meet on today, the Western Waka Waka, Gaibal and Jarrawa peoples, and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the knowledge, the rich traditions and bold ambitions of Australia's first peoples. <coughs> so we have um, two leave of absences today, Councillor Paul Antonio, the Mayor, and Councillor Tim McMahon. Do I have anyone seeking le any leaves of absence? No? Okay, so with that, can I have someone move that we suspend standing orders, please? Councillor MacDonald, Councillor Shine, all those in favour? It's carried. So we move to item number four, which is the material change of use impact undefined use um, located at 462 Blackwell Road, Captain's Mountain. And so we have senior planner Richard Green to present to us. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, if I could just get um, attachment number two up on the up on the board when I start, but I'll start anyway. Um, the application under consideration today is the second of two separate development applications for meteorological masks, which have been lodged over separate land parcels within the Captain's Mountains locality. As a point of clarification, the first development application located. <laughs> The first development application located uh, was located at 9462 Gore Highway, Captain's Mountain, and was presented to and approved at the special meeting of Council on, the West, on Wednesday the 2nd of June 2021. The current application being considered today is the second and final of the two development applications, and it seeks a development permit for a material change of use for an undefined use for a meteorological mass on land located at 462 Blackwell Road, Captain's Mountain and it's located approximately nine kilometres southwest of Milmarin, as you can see from the map. The subject site comprises two land parcels and has a combined site area of approximately 362 hectares and is located within the rural zone, 100 hectare minimum precinct. If I could just go to attachment four, thank you. The site is currently utilised for the purpose of cattle grazing and is improved by a dwelling house and ancillary structures on both of the lots. This application seeks to allow the construction of the mass within the subject land for the purposes of climatic monitoring to assist in determining the site's suitability for a possible future wind farm. The mass will be located within the western portion of this land, with the base of the tower set back approximately 65 metres from the western side boundary. And if I can go to cat, uh, attachment number six, I'm jumping all over the place. The mass is of steel, steel lattice construction. Um, and it's a maximum of 105 metres in height. It'll be supported by guy wires as well. The mast will be equipped with wind and weather sensors, sensors at various heights, which will allow measurements of wind speed, wind direction, wind shear, wind turbulence, and air density, amongst other data. The mast will be fitted with lightning arresters and grounded at the base of the tower and at each of the guy wire supports. The electronic systems used on the mast will utilise the 12 volt power system consisting of a battery storage unit charged by a small solar array attached to the tower. The mass occupies a limited footprint of the subject site, with only the tower base and guy wire anchor points, and the six of those, physically connected to the ground, allowing for the continued use of the land for agricultural purposes. The tower base and anchor points will be provided with anti-climb protection and cattle, pen and cattle panel fencing to avoid damage by livestock. Vehicle access to the mast will be provided via an existing crossover adjoining Blackwell Road and an unsealed gravel access track to the tower side. Building activity associated with the construction of the mast is anticipated to be completed within approximately five days, which includes installation and testing of all sensors and equipment. Once operational, minimal access will be required to conduct routine maintenance, with an average of two to three site visits per year by light vehicle. The mast itself is located within a mostly cleared portion of the site, away from any mature uh, vegetation. There's a few grass trees which the applicant will be asked to relocate if they're in the actual footprint. 
In this regard, any vegetation regrowth within the area will be monitored and, where necessary, removed as part of a routine, as part of a routine maintenance regime. Given that the purpose of the MAST is to obtain meteorological data to assist in determining the site suitability for the possible future establishment of a wind farm, the use is only temporary. The lifespan of the use <coughs> is up to five years, after which time the tower, all infrastructure and equipment will be removed and the land returned to pre-development state. On this point, it's noted that the construction of the mast itself does not confirm that a wind farm will ultimately be established. Any subsequent decision to establish a wind farm on the site in the future is subject to further development approval, and that is assessed by the State Not Council. And a range of commercial and physical considerations, not least of which is the demonstrated meteorological suitability of the site for such purposes. The application was also publicly notified uh, two submissions were received rejecting to the proposed development. In summary, matters raised related to visual impact, separation from sensitive receptors, noise impact, impact on wildlife fauna, compliance with statutory public notification procedures, um, impact on the operations of the adjoining rifle range to the south, uh, and that the proposal will ultimately lead to the establishment of a wind farm. Whilst the detailed response to these matters is provided within the report, the following comment is made. <coughs> If I could just go to attachment three, which I think you've got. Given that the proposed purpose of the MAS is to obtain data to assist in determining the site suitability for the possible future establishment of a wind farm, it's not practical to consider a reduced height. Specifically, the MET MAS has been purposely sized to ensure that the measurements and data collected accurately indicate the meteorological conditions experienced at any future wind turbine generator hub height. Nevertheless, given the lightweight slimline lattice construction of the structure, it is not considered to have a detrimental impact on the scenic qualities of the area. Despite being a distinctive element within the rural landscape, the structure itself is only clearly visible when viewed from close proximity. When considering the setback of the mast from Blackwell Road, the, site, uh, the Blackwell Road front sightage, which is to the north and to the uh, east of the site, uh, it's approximately 1.4 kilometres at its closest point. The visual impact of the structure would be reasonably diminished. Similarly, the MET mast is well separated from the nearest sensitive receptors, with the closest to us <coughs> situated approximately 1.8 kilometres uh, east from the base of the mast. Additionally, as noticed previously, the mast will, not only, uh, will only be operational and a visual element in the landscape for a restricted, restricted period of time. The mast has an anticipated lifespan of up to five years, after which time all infrastructure and equipment will be removed and the land returned to pre-developed state. The proposed development has been assessed against all relevant assessment benchmarks, including the entire planning scheme and state planning policy, as outlined in the report. The proposed development generally complies with the planning scheme or can be conditioned to comply with the planning scheme. Further detailed assessment of matters of non-compliance are detailed within the report. Therefore, the proposed development is recommended to be approved subject to reasonable and relevant conditions. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Any questions or comments for the officer? Councillor Shine. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just a matter of interest, uh, the earlier one, the 2nd of June, was it the same applicant? It's the same applicant, yes, and, uh, separate site. Any reason why they weren't done together? or? Does it uh, they were both lodged around the same time. It's yeah. just this one required an additional referral and that's delayed it in right. terms of it being presented today, a bit, you know, about a month or so later than the other one. Yeah. Uh, it's immaterial, really, isn't it? Yep. The, um, uh, I think you said the height of it was 100 metres odd. About, about a, between 100 and 105, there's abouts. Yeah. And it's 65 metres from the boundary. 65 metres from the base, yes. So if it fell westward by you know, something happening, it yes. would impact the next door neighbour? I guess technically if it were to fail, uh, you could conceivably have a... Have there's, a nobody, yeah. there's no buildings there or anything of that nature? No, no, and we'd hope that it wouldn't fail, but yes, conceivably, yes. No further questions or comments? Thanks, Richard. Um, so we do have a submitter, uh, Robert McKenzie. Robert, if you'd like to come up to the mic. Yes. Thank you. Code assessed for impact. Because of the submitters? So, Robert, you've got five minutes, but you don't have okay. to rush or... Yeah. No, that's all right. Okay. Thank you. Take it away. Right. Members of the Council, 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity to have our say about the proposed change of land use for a meteorological mast very close to our property. I would like to say that we chose the location of our house because of the views in all directions. Natural bush mountains to the north and east and landscape views to the south and west. A land use change to the mountains east of us will allow a tower higher than any of the trees there to be built. This tower is proposed to be on the highest point of the mountain, extending well above anything around it. A 100 metre tall tower will be seen by us from our house and anywhere on our property. There will be no hiding it. It will be a visual eyesore on the skyline. There are no other visible man-made structures on the mountains to the east, and recently I stopped at a lookout near the Sapphire Wind Farm in New South Wales and could see what looked to be a similar tower to the proposal. It could definitely be clearly seen. The photograph in the development application of a similar mast did not reflect its true visual impact. Likewise, the photos in our submission of the view from our house do not clearly show the wonderful view we actually see. Over the years, we have watched the wedge-tailed eagles hunting above our farms, and we know that they are nesting very close to where this proposed tower, with its protruding guide wires, would be built. We are concerned that they may be hurt or the habitat impacted by the tower. We enjoy the clear night skies and spend a lot of evenings watching the moon rise over these mountains. This tower will interrupt these views that were part of the reason we chose our house site. A light on this tower would make it even more intrusive. If the submission made by the Sporting Shooters Association regarding the safety zone is upheld, is it likely that the location of the mast will be changed to a different position on the mountain. Any change would have the site in an even more direct line from our house. Our house is positioned with the front directly to the east looking towards this mountain. Any change to the material use of the land involved may open a pathway to allow a larger, noisy, and intrusive wind generators to be constructed without further council approvals or involvement being required. This may be our only chance to object to any such development at council level. I ask council to please consider the long-term impacts this change of use decision could have on families and business businesses in our area. Thank you. Well done. Stay there, Robert, just in case anyone's got any questions for you. No? Okay. Oh, Councillor Von Hoff? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, it's actually not to Robert, but thank you, Robert, for speaking to your, your submission today. It is an issue that has been raised in the properly made submission, the visual impact. And, Madam Chair, I note the response from council officers of how the matter was dealt with um, but it doesn't go to what Robert was saying about the amenity of his, of where he lives and the enjoyment of his property. Can we have comment, please, from an officer about um, the extent to which that consideration is taken into account when planning or when considering this? Thank you, absolutely. Um, the comment that we make in general is uh, we talk about the closest sensitive receptor and that basically is a suggestion to say that um, in terms of the view of the tower, there's no way that you're not necessarily going to see it. It is going to be visible, uh, unfortunately, but in terms of its design, it is actually designed to such an extent that it's the smallest, most lightweight structure you can possibly get away with that's stable enough to do what they need to do. Um, as I said, you're looking at over a kilometre from all the nearest houses in all directions. Um, but unfortunately, yes, um, as with everything, uh, some people will possibly get a, a clearer sight line uh, than others. 
Uh, it will be in the vistas of some people's views and it certainly will be in vistas of other people's views from greater distances, no doubt. Um, but weighing it all up, unfortunately, it's one of those things where you give weight to it where it is an element that's going to be in the landscape, but it's not an element that is necessarily a long-term element. It's only a, about five years that it's going to be there. And yes, it may, may inform a decision by uh, the state in the future as to whether or not a, a wind farm does occur in that locality. Um, but I guess weighing it all up, it's not dissimilar to a telecommunication tower or a, um, a radio tower that may be something that comes into council for consideration and we look at it from the perspective of, well, you know, ideally you'd love not have these things, but uh, if you are to have them, uh, this one's been located in a position where it needs to be to get the data they need to have, but it's also a, a temporary uh, structure. Um, and and um, weighing it all up, it's not something that's going to be there permanently. Uh, and it's certainly not something that uh, draws attentions to itself unless you're sort of, I suppose, looking for it, in, in, I guess is how I would respond to that. Thank you, Madam Chair. So a supplementary, I suppose, in response to that, Mr McKenzie would likely say it will be replaced with something more temporary in all likelihood, and that is a wind farm, mm. be that as it may. Um, I, I see the response in here, and I hear what you're saying, and I hear what Mr McKenzie's saying, and it sounds like there isn't weighting given to what Mr McKenzie is saying about his enjoyment of his property is going to be impacted by this, and what of that? Yeah. I guess in saying that, I think we have given weight to it. I think we acknowledge that it's a scenic thing that's going to be seen in there, but it's not something that's detrimental uh, to the landscape qualities. And it's not long-term. It's In many ways, it's no different to even a high-voltage uh, high power line easement that don't, may go through the, uh, you know, the rural environment. These things are, in this case, we're considering it today, obviously, but they're an element necessary, I suppose, that needs to be done for someone to do investigations um, and I guess in saying that, I've given a great deal of weight to the fact that it's not a permanent structure. And I do acknowledge it is visible. I've made no attempt to cover that up. I've simply made the judgment call to say, well, as the structure goes for what its intended purpose is, the applicant has done the best they can do to diminish its impact on the actual environment. And I think, I think it succeeds in doing that. And I think it actually does uh, address the criteria under the scheme. So legislatively, there is no, there is nothing further to be considered in line with Mr. McKenzie's comments. Uh, as I say, the comments have been made uh, summarised in the report. There's been a, a response provided by myself in the report, uh, which I believe addresses the concerns um, to an acceptable manner. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Tao. Th th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I think therein lies the problem. I mean, I don't think really that this mast by itself is um, be there for less than five years. Should this become a wind farm, that'll be a stake significant project and um, and we will probably have no say in that, we the council, except for where it... Yeah, certainly certain, the state will, will no, actually... No uh, say. And I think that's the issue more with the objectors probably and that they can see uh, a bigger threat down the road. Unfortunately, we have to look at this for what it is and deal with it like that. But I do have a certain amount of sympathy. I mean, we all think these things are really wonderful, except when they bob up near you. And that's the issue that we find here. And I, I sympathise with you, Mr McKenzie, on that. So do you have Thank a question, you. Councillor Taylor? The question was, would it be a state significant project? Okay. And we, the council, local government we here, would have little input into the decision. Well, it's a state-run process, yes. but council is certainly consulted with regards to that. So yes, there but is, it's, not there is, our, it's not our decision. It, it won't come before no, council for no. a decision, no. Thank you, and I think I knew that. I just wanted to confirm it. Thanks. Councillor Sumfield. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, uh, and thanks, Richard, and thanks, Mr McKenzie. Uh, look, I'd, I'd just like you to walk us through what process would occur if we were to approve this today and then in five years' time they've got the results and they decide, yes, it is an appropriate site for... Uh, wind mm. farm. Could you, you walk us through the process from there, Richard, so that we fully understand as a council just how much influence that we have? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not um, an expert on such matters, but I don't know whether 
You might want to make a comment. That's all right. Are councillors, in five years, if there was a decision of the proponent to actually apply for a wind farm, they would make that application directly to the state. Um, we recently actually gave some feedback in relation to a wind farm proposal where the wind farm was actually in another region, but certain of the infrastructure came through our local government area. So what the state would do is that they would provide us with correspondence asking if we have any input in relation or wish for there to be any input in relation to the application. For example, the recent um, proposal that we did provide feedback on, we had the opportunity to comment on the proposal and we raised concerns in that the big, what do you call them, turbines? Turbine. Mm. Turbines were going to be transferred through our region and there was a particular, I can't remember which township it was, but where there were some issues in terms of how they were going to actually get the turbines through the road network. So mm. we provided feedback and asked for information there. Um, so they took that into account, then they actually came back to us, the state, um, just before they were ready to issue a decision and gave us a copy of the draft conditions that they were proposing to impose and we were given another opportunity to comment then and we actually did comment and provide feedback and ask for additional conditions to be imposed to protect our region's interests and they did respond to those and did include additional conditions. So they do consult with the local authority. I guess the only issue is that the ultimate decision is the state's, yeah. not ours. Thank you. I think just Danielle. quickly do a follow-up. So, um, and I might be pushing um, how you can respond, Danielle, but I'm just wondering how strong um, a case would amenity be? Oh. So there are a number of houses in that area, um, according to the map. I guess, I guess if we had a concern that it would be a, you know, a future wind farm might be a particular visual blight, then we could provide that feedback. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm not sure of what the decision rules of the state are. They're not the same as our decision rules on an application, but I guess they would similarly weigh up you know, the pros and the cons, the consistencies, the inconsistencies, and ultimately make a decision. I guess from a state perspective, the fact that they have determined that they wish to have jurisdiction around the assessment of these alternative energy proposals does indicate that they are particularly supportive of these proposals and are looking to facilitate where possible. But I don't think, and I can't speak for the state, but I don't believe that they would disregard concerns around visual amenity because you're really looking at the positioning of a whole series of wind turbines. Um, so it may be that they do request that, that something be shifted or altered if, if there's an opportunity to do that, if they think particularly that there's a concern from a visual amenity perspective. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shine. Oh, just wondering, is it possible uh, <coughs> on that map or, or a photo or, or something or another one to indicate where Mr Mackenzie's uh, residence is in relation to the mast proposal. It's just on attachment three, Yes, yes, just the, just in that vicinity. But there's keep going to where all the lines are. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. There's a boundary. That's our boundary there. Do you have any further questions, Councillor Shine? Uh, and uh, the. Uh, there's no photo showing the uh, the landscape, is that, from the house to the mast? Well, the wiggly lines are... No, but you can see the contour yeah. lines yeah. on the plan there. Which, what, Steep. indicates a mountain? Mm. Yeah, you can see that, you know, it goes from 600 metres down to 580, so there's quite a, you know... There was photos submitted with the, um, 
uh, objection. Yeah. No, they're not they're available. Not, they're not available. Yeah. But obviously, it would sit at a high point. Clara. Councillor Von Hoff. Clarification on those photographs that Mr. McKenzie refers to. Are they not allowed to be included in the submission, or were they? It was just decided that they would not be included in the dis submission. In the assessment report in today, the, yes. It sorry, was just we don't put everything into the assessment report, and obviously it was a decision that you know they weren't included. Any further questions for Mr. McKenzie? No. Well done, Robert. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity Thank you. to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Robert. Uh, now, Andrew Bullen is going to come and speak to us um, on behalf of the applicant. <coughs> Andrew, of course, is from Precinct Urban Planning. Thanks, Councillor. Um, I just could probably touch on a few points that have been raised by um, Councillor Von Hoff and Councillor Taylor, just to clarify a couple of things. Um, the councils will remember the last tower that came through and approved in early June. Probably the first thing I'll say is the location of the masts themselves is not necessarily where a wind farm, if it did proceed, would go. The purpose of the mast, well, both masts, is to, is to test wind, wind conditions the councillors who were here when the last one was um, determined might recall Elise Wise from Vesta being here, and I think a similar question came up that day. And what her advice was at the time is that they put one mast at a fairly low point in the locality that they're looking at, and one at a very high point in the locality. And the idea is to take wind measurements at the high point and the low point. And I'm not a technically across why they do that, but they need that to, to correlate um, the suitability of the area from a wind perspective for a wind farm. So it's a general area they're looking at. Um, if it was proved to be suitable and they decided, and it's only one criteria, physical suitability, I'll add, there's a lot of other things that go into it as well. Um, but that would then, that, that data would then determine where the wind farm should go and the individual turbines. Just on um, issues of visual impact, I'll touch on those, uh, and I guess to answer your your question, uh, Councillor Von Hoff, visual impact is absolutely a pivotal consideration, planning consideration. It, it is really a subset of what's referred to as amenity or pl the pleasantness of a place, which is prominent in any planning assessment uh, of an application. And if you break down issues of visual impact, I'll probably say a couple of things on those. Firstly, visibility is not necess necessarily synonymous with visual impact. So I think most people agree that you can probably see the Sydney Harbour Bridge from most areas in Sydney, but few would argue it has an adverse visual impact. Now, I'm not for a minute comparing a Met mast to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but I'm highlighting, I guess, the concept that actually seeing something isn't synonymous in planning terms with something also having an adverse visual impact. So when we look at visual impact, obviously considerations that are relevant are scale, bulk, so obviously height, how dominant it is in the landscape, colour, reflectivity, all of those sort of sorts of considerations. Now a lot of those matters were discussed in more detail last time, but I can probably answer some of those. The height, as Richard alluded to, is essential. Uh, the height's quite purposefully at that 100, 105 metre mark relative to the other tower to get the measurements that are required. The design of the tower, Vestas have done many of these, they're the largest manufacturer of wind turbines in the world, and the tower over time has been purposely designed. It's supported by guide wires, and one of the reasons for that is not only its height, but it allows a much more slimline lattice design to, to be used. By being slimline in design, it's less bulky in the landscape. By being a lattice tower, it increases its transparency. Um, by it being galvanised, it's not reflective. And by not being painted, which it won't need to be in these situations, essentially they're only painted where, they, where they're near an airfield or an airport for safety reasons. Uh, all of those matters contribute to lowering the visual impact. In the planning report that we submitted, or both the planning reports, there was a, a picture put in 
uh, that, page 21, I think it was, of the report, if, if councillors want to have a look at it, which was a photo of a identical tower uh, erected by Vestas from a distance of 720 metres. And admittedly, we're the first to admit, uh, as, as a submitter correctly said, that when you reproduce a photo in a report or a submission, it probably doesn't accurately, 100% accurately reflect what you're seeing if you're standing there. But what it does clearly highlight is, yes, you can see it, yes, it's detectable, but I would contend that it doesn't indicate it would have an adverse visual impact, mainly because of those reasons, height, bulk, colour, reflectivity, or lack thereof. Um, so on balance, we would say that um, given the type of infrastructure it is and the one essential part of it, which is its height, it pretty well does do everything else to reduce that visual impact. And, and my view, like Richard's, would be that it's fairly successful in doing that. The other thing, as Richard alluded to, separation is important. In, in siding the tower, Vestas do have a lot of consideration to surrounding sensitive receptors. They've provided plans showing that level of separation. Issues we've dealt with with the previous application, I won't labour. Issues like noise, the design of the tower again, the guidewise will not um, vibrate or create noise. Um, there's many examples of where these towers have been built. That, that just simply hasn't been an issue. Similarly, wildlife impacts on wildlife. There's no documented evidence of adverse impacts on wildlife or bird life with these towers. The, the rural use of land can continue around the base of the tower. When the, the tower's life is finished, it's removed and, and decommissioned the site's fully returned to its natural state, or the state it was pre-development, including, including digging up any footings and removing those at that time. The only other submission that was made here, just very quickly, which was probably unique to this site, relative to, to the one the council considered previously, was the issue of, on an adjoining property, the Milmerin Sporting Shooters have uh, almost a gentleman's agreement, I'd describe it as, to use part of that land as an area where periodically they'll, they'll undertake the, what a sporting shooters club does in terms of recreational shooting. As part of that, um, essentially the club has an agreement with the landowners um, to use their land. That agreement's fully in the favour of the landholders, so landholders have said to the club, you can informally use this but you need to indemnify us against any risk, damage, everything. So it's fully in the favour of the, of the owners. Um, the agreement can be terminated at any time. The um, club has no approval to operate. That's not really a matter that Vestas have a problem with, but there isn't a development approval in place. There isn't any security of tenure. There's no lease, there's no permit to occupy or anything like that. So in, in those terms, I mean, the club's ability to operate there is very much at the behest of, of the owners. They did submit in their submission a, a template for the range. That's a mandatory requirement for any rifle range to um, get their necessary approvals through the weapons licensing branch. So if you're going to discharge firearms, you need approval through that branch. That's fairly critical. So the template they have used um, is fine, it was accepted by the weapons branch, no doubt, but it's a military template for a military firing range, of which this isn't. It's about 3,000 metres long. The furthest any of the rifles will shoot in, that are used in that environment as sporting shooters is about 500 metres. Once you get to the 500 metre mark, there's a prominent ridge line, and even someone who is as bad a shot as I would be would not be able to get over that ridge line. Um, and even if it did, um, it's not conceivable that with a range of 500 metres you're going to get anywhere near the tower, which is about the best part of three kilometres away. Um, we also probably note that the mast is not a sensitive use. It's not manned. It's, it's not, we're not talking about a house or anything like that. It's constructed over a period of about five days, as Richard said, and uh, maintenance, barring failure of equipment, will be more like once every six to 12 months, sometimes twice a year. So it, it will virtually sit there, take its measurements. It's self-powered on solar. Those, all of those measurements can be 
downloaded over the internet effectively by the people who are undertaking the research, so they don't need to visit the site. Um, so that's sort of the status of where that group is. Vestas has no problem with the rifle range next door, continuing to operate as it does. Um, it's not necessary of interest to them what their status is in a town planning sense, but they did want to stress those things because there's no practical impact on this site at all or on their operations in reverse. Um, so they're Good, possibly... Andrew, I've let you run too long. So right. stay there and we'll see whether anyone's got any questions so, for you or comments. Yes, Councillor Madam Taylor. Chair, thank you very much. Can you just indicate to us, Andrew, thank you very much for your information, where, what area the rifle area you use in relation to the proposed tower? The, it's, I don't know if I can. Good luck. But it is that bottom. It's pretty much that bottom house measurement. So the one pointing yeah. backwards. Where so if you go direct, directly down. south, where that dimension that is. House and that's the firing range. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. From there. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Andrew? Oh, oh, Councillor yeah, Bonner. I have another one. Well, thanks, Madam Chair. Through you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the photograph that you referred to, that was included in your submission to Council, that showed a similar. A, a similar tower, a similar distance, has not been included in our report. Right. No. So it would be helpful through you, Madam Chair, uh, to have some of those inf those photos included when we are talking about visual amenity. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can do about it, yeah. Andrew. It's a, not a question to you, it's a comment. Okay, Thanks. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, if I could just ask, you mentioned there's no damage, uh, no threat to birds. I would imagine that with wire there, if they can't really see them, that there would be. Is that Would they be thinking, is it possible to have some strips or something put on there? So, Yeah. Also, yeah. I think in the report, there's pictures of individual parts of the equipment that will be attached to the wires and the tower. And if my memory serves me correctly, they do have um, uh, some, um, I don't know what the term would be, but they're like a plastic ball around parts of it to see. So, so, you can you can, so it's visible? It's, it's visible. Because you yeah. can't see a piece of wire. I mean, yeah. I, how many of us run into them ourselves? Yeah. 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 So the, thank you. Yep. Okay. Go. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much. All right. Well, with that, can I have someone move that we reinstate standing orders? Thank you. Councillor Taylor and Councillor Carl. All those in favour? Okay, so the recommendation is there that Council approve application MCU 2021 931 for a development permit for a material change of use impact undefined use met mass pursuant to the provisions of section 60 of the Planning Act 2016 and subject to the conditions listed below. Do I have someone move that recommendation? Councillor Carl, seconder. Councillor O'Shea, all those in favour? motion's carried. Thank you. And do we want a division? Anyone calling for a division? No? Okay. The meeting's closed. Thank you, everyone.